His wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion and splendor, and girded with praise. Oh, tell them His might, oh, sing of His grace, whose robe is the light and canopy stays. Good morning. Man, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. What a great time of worship and fellowship and Bible study we have already had today and looking forward to what God is going to do in this worship service today. You finally get a break, right, from me preaching, uh, but unfortunately you had to put up with me singing. My family's like looking at it like trying to look away from a train crash, right, because they know when I sit right down here and sing... Uh, I don't care, and I just miss words constantly, and they're kind of like doing like this, open up here on stage. I don't embarrass them and mess up the words tragically, but man, it is so good to have the opportunity. I love to sing. I love to worship. It's not my gift, but man, I'm so thankful that today I kind of get to do something a little bit different. Man, I, I love the opportunity that God has afforded us with men and women in our church who are being theologically trained, who are pursuing God's call on their life. It is exciting to see what God has been doing. And so about the last four months, uh, each month, a different individual from our church has preached the word for us on a Sunday morning in my stead. And today, Lee Pounds is going to be doing that, our chairman of deacons, small group Bible study leader, just a faithful servant in the life of the church. Uh, he feels called to ministry, doesn't know at what level, but judging from the 9 o'clock service, it may be preaching. He's really, really good. Did a fantastic job this morning at 9 uh, this is not what he does every day, so you can imagine for him there may be some nerves and anxiety. I just encourage you to pray for him, lift him up this morning as he gets ready to come and preach the Word of God to us. And again, man, uh, the Lord just used him in a great way at 9. Looking forward to what God's going to use him to do right now in this service as well. If you're our guest, we're glad that you're here. I want to encourage you. Uh, if, if you've never uh, filled a yellow card out for us, if you've never dropped that in the uh, worship boxes that are at the corners that we typically put our tithes and offerings in, we'd love to just kind of have a record of you being with us. We'd love to be able to put a name with a face. So if you're here, we're glad you're here. But we'd love to get to know you. And we know in the COVID setting, it's not quite as easy to get to know you. Uh, and this is just kind of one of the ways that we can do that. So we're glad that you're here. 
Church family, next Sunday night, we are going to be having a, uh, a worship service, 6 o'clock. We don't typically do that uh, on Sunday nights. We reserve Sunday nights to do things like what we're going to do next Sunday night, just a special service uh, in, in recognition and support of our servant leadership team. Our deacons are our servant leaders uh, in the life of our church uh, who serve in so many different capacities. And next week, we will vote as a church on the men coming on, and we will also ordain one who has been on for the last year uh, and has served faithfully with us. And so we're going to be ordaining him uh, in that service as well. So it'll be a, an intimate, special service. And I want to encourage you to, to be a part of that service. We don't always get the opportunity to do these kind of services like we used to. Used to, it was just a regular occurrence. Uh, and uh, as time has progressed, it's kind of, uh, there, there are fewer and far between times that we do this. So I want to encourage as a church family to come and celebrate that time as we vote on those men to come as servant leaders and then also to ordain the one who has been serving with us. So we're looking forward to that service next week. Hey, I want us to pray together this morning, and then we're going to continue and worship together. Father God, thank you so much for being King of kings and Lord of lords. God, that's it's really what we're singing about today. And God, as we think about you being king and you being sovereign and you being creator and you being control and you being the only one. And God, I know right now we, we live in a country and a nation. It seems like the wheels are falling off. God, it feels like everywhere we look, there's turmoil and there's tension. And God, there are a lot of us who our hopes are riding on an election in about a week and two days. And God, we want your will to be done in that election. But Father God, no matter who is in control, no matter who is in power on this earth, you are still king. God, you proved it uh, in the Old Testament with King Cyrus and this pagan king who nobody would have voted for if they were Jewish. He was the one who said, go back to your homeland and go back and rebuild your place of worship. Father God, we pray right now knowing that no matter who is in control and who is in power, you ultimately are king. You are king of kings and Lord of lords. And the most important thing that we can do as we come to this moment, to this hour of worship, is to submit our hearts and lives to you. God, to humbly bow before you. That's what we come to do today. You humbly bow before a king. And God, you do that uh, in a posture. You do that with your physical body here on earth. But Father God, you being King of kings and Lord of lords of all creation, God, it is not just a physical gesture that you're looking for. You're looking for our heart and our mind and our will to be submitted to you, to be yielded to you because you truly are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And God, we praise you this morning and we thank you for this opportunity that we have together to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we pray and we ask all this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we continue to worship.
Father God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for being King of Kings. But Father God, you, you're not just King of Kings upon a throne. You're King of Kings who came to this earth. And, and as that song said, you came to reconcile us back to you. You came to redeem us, pay the price we couldn't pay so that we could be with you forever. And Father God, we today I pray if our hearts have never gripped that, that you are a king who could have done anything that you wanted. But God, you chose to come and identify with us and take our estate and take our lowliness and take our sin and die. You took the punishment that was supposed to be for us so that we could be with you forever. And God, we thank you for being that kind of king that has a heart of love and mercy and forgiveness and that you extend it to us. God, we love you and we praise you. And God, I just ask right now that you'd hide Lee behind the cross. And Father, I pray right now your word and your spirit would fill him by your power and you'd speak to us through him. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Hey, that was a lot better in the first service. I think I have more people in my small group Bible study than I do in the, than we had in the first service. Um, <clears throat> my name's Lee Pounds, for those of you who don't know. Um, I'm a second chair to Lexi at base over here in the praise team. Uh, I teach small group Bible study with Stephen Sasser upstairs. I'm the chairman of the deacons, yada, 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 dot, dot, dot. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to serve in the church, and so we talked about this morning uh, about how uh, that is an action step. So we're going to actually mention a little bit of that today. Uh, this, the section of scripture that we're going to be in is Luke uh, 19, 28 through 44. If you'll go ahead and turn there with me. Um, and the title of today's message is Stop Asking for a David. Stop Asking for a David. Uh, no, no offense to David Gallo. I'm sorry. Uh, but Stop Asking for a David. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and read the scripture, and then we'll pray, and we'll get started. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say this, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, throwing their cloaks on the colt. They set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, With that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you, and hem you in on every side, and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Before we pray, I'm going to preface the, the, the lesson today, I'll say lesson, the sermon today with, I'm going to be asking a series of questions, and my prayer in preparation through all of this has been, has been that the Holy Spirit answers those for you. The Holy Spirit is calling those answers to you. So let's pray before we get started. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Um, thank you for this church. Thank you for spiritual leaders in this church. Um, Lord, as your creation, I pray that you're speaking into our hearts and you're calling us to action so that we can step out in love through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so some context. We've been in Luke now for a very, very long time. Uh, this will be the last sermon out of Luke. Uh, so I do get the opportunity to kind of sum it all up. No pressure, right? Um, 
but just to get some context, just previously to this, Jesus has healed a blind man. Uh, he's dined with a sinner in his home, Zacchaeus. And last week we got the opportunity to hear Tim sing the Zacchaeus song, uh, which was awesome. My kids would have, you know, probably joined right in. Uh, thanks to my mother-in-law, she, that was one of the, like, with first words, they could sing the Zacchaeus song. Uh, he finishes his journey with the parable of the ten minas. And in this part of scripture, Jesus is finishing his ministry in somewhat of a hasteful manner as he's coming down out of the Mount of Olives and headed into Jerusalem, which actually means the city of peace. Jerusalem means the city of peace. So in verse 28 in our scripture, what you should see, and no matter what translation you have, you should see a form of he went ahead or he went before. Uh, this is a Greek word that I'm going to mess up, uh, but it's a Greek word that says improsthen, which is in front or before the face. Uh, the same word is used in Mark 10, 32, where Jesus is walking ahead of them, ahead of his disciples, predicting his death. So the question I have to ask you after this section of Scripture if we look for examples to follow, is who are you keeping in front of you? If you think about before the face, the disciples are following Jesus, and Jesus has the destination ahead of him. Right, so kind of keep that as a visual image. Who are you following? This was a challenging part of uh, the, the study for me, just because I had to I have to answer these questions as I'm going through it, and I've, I told Tim earlier, you know, I don't I don't know if I've actually ever cried that much typing as I'm going through these things. Uh, it's it's amazing how you have to deal with it yourself. Um, but the conclusion is, we should be filtering everything we do through the Word, through Jesus Christ. We need to keep this, the Bible, in front of us. As a church, we're taking on the new motto: love God, love people, and change the world. So, to summarize, are you following Christ? Is he always in front? And are we loving God so that he can love people through us? How do we follow? Psalms 119, 11 through 16 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as all in riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. So the first way we can follow is memorizing word. I will, I will be honest. I struggle. My memory, I can remember a face till the day I die. I can pass you in the mall and probably point you out three weeks later. But I cannot force myself to memorize things. So this has been a spiritual discipline of my, of my own that I've been trying. And it, it's a little... Ironic that I had to read the scripture about memorizing scripture, but uh, this is something that we, this is a spiritual discipline we should be practicing. This is going to help you grow in your faith, but honestly, it's a filter for, for the world around you. The second way we follow is listen and be obedient. In our scripture that we just read in, in Luke 19, our scripture tells, the, uh, Jesus tells the disciples to go and get a cult with very specific instructions, and they immediately do so without question. There's some debate around whether this was a miracle or a prearranged um, event. Uh, there's good evidence for both, I guess. It doesn't really matter. Uh, that's usually how I, how I end up with those types of conundrums. It, it doesn't really matter because Jesus coming to this earth was a miracle no matter what, right? Um, and so I'm thankful for that. Um, but Jesus in John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will follow my word. So who are you following? Are you following yourself? Are you following yourself? That's, uh, I think that's common in today's world. Uh, there's, no, there's no lie that, you know, social media uses the word followers for a reason. They play into your psyche, right? Because you can have followers. Are you following yourself? Uh, one of the images that comes to mind is always you would look like a dog chasing his tail if you really think about following yourself. Um, the next, are, are you following someone in Hollywood, Washington, New York? Are you following money, fame, power? If you are, I do have a proclamation for you today. Those paths are not God's path. They will never be God's path. 
I want you to understand that. If you put somebody of this earth out in front of you, besides Jesus Christ, they are not God's path. They may take you down some of the same alleyways, some of the same thoroughfares. You may ride on Main Street together, but I promise you, you will not end up in the same destination. When you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're on God's path. And you're headed for a holy communion with God Almighty who is in heaven for eternity. And you set your sight, if you set your sights on things of this world, you're headed to the same end. Destruction. You're headed for God's wrath. Back to our scripture. In Luke, the disciples have retrieved the colt, a new never ridden colt or donkey. They put their cloaks on its back and picked Jesus up and set him on it. His followers begin to lay out their cloaks for the colt to walk on. The other gospels mention uh, cutting branches and palm leaves and laying them down in the path of the colt. Um, it's not mentioned here in Luke. Uh, the procession, this procession is really reserved for royalty. So they are, you know, this is a common thing in the time. They are treating him as royalty in this moment. And the thing to think of that, that growing up, I guess I always, you know, you, why, why am I taking my clothes off and laying it down on the road for a horse to, or donkey to walk on, right? Doesn't make any sense. Um, but the way to think about it is the very ground is not worthy of being walked on by the donkey that Jesus is sitting on. That's the proclamation they're making in this action. This is also a fulfillment of prophecy from Zechariah 9 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is the first time in Jesus' ministry where he's allowed his followers to treat him as such, to treat him as a king, to treat him as royalty. Jesus came to this earth as a servant. And the disciples lifting Jesus physically onto this colt while the other disciples are shouting joy and praise. He's being treated as a king. So the next question I have that I hope the Holy Spirit is answering for you is, who are you lifting up? Who are you lifting up? If we opened up all of your previous Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, email, snail mail, or telegrams, whatever it is you use, what is the subject of your conversation? What is the subject of your conversation? If we played out recordings of all of your previous conversations you've ever had, even those you've had in private with yourself, what is the subject of conversation? The moment you take thoughts and have these conversations, you type it out, you say it, you do it, they become action. We spend our moments in time filling them with these actions. These actions define who we are and what we represent. So do you represent the church? If you played back all these conversations, all these interactions you've had with people, all the time you've spent in small group, all the time you've spent praying, all the time you've spent at work, do you represent the church? I feel like a lot of people would say yes, and if you do say yes, then you should definitely look like it. We had a small group not that long ago. Uh, the study was Galatians 5, 16 through 26. And there it compares two lists, one being sinful and one being fruits of the Spirit. And, you know, as I was preparing that, I, you know, I struggled myself. Uh, I, not that I was necessarily, you know, embodying all the sinful lists, but there were areas of the fruits of the Spirit that I lack. I was... You know, I don't necessarily portray those the way I need to. One being self-control. Uh, through, through, you know, prayer and scripture, I've been working on those. Um, but what's funny about these verses is right there at verse 25, right there at the end, it, you know, people cut it off from chapter to chapter, usually when you're studying scripture. But our actions are kind of spoken about as you move into chapter 6. Um, and so I'll read that here. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. 
For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he is deceiving himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. So back in the first part of that, in verse 2, bear one another's burdens. Are you bearing each other's burdens? Are, examine your actions. Who are you lifting up? Who are you putting in front of you? James 4, 7 through 10 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. If we humble ourselves before God, he will lift you up. So we have a picture here in Luke. The disciples have retrieved this colt. We have, uh, they're setting Jesus up on the colt. Uh, they're headed down into Jerusalem, coming out of the Mount, Mount of Olives, um, headed into the city of peace. And they have followers. So uh, I, I don't want you to think that this is an isolated event. This is not, you know, 20 people following a guy on a donkey. This is not what this is. There is a bunch of people headed into Jerusalem. This is Passover. Everybody's coming in for Passover week. This is a crowded street. Um, you have people that have seen Jesus over his ministry who have seen the things he's done. He's, they've heard his parables. They've heard his teachings. And they see Jesus coming down being proclaimed as king. In my study, I read a commentary by Leon Morris on, you know, on the book of Luke. Uh, and I'll, I'll quote something he had there. They had for a long time watched and waited for him to proclaim himself as the Messiah of their hopes. Now they say they saw him doing so. He was riding into the capital in a way that fulfilled prophecy. He was showing himself to be the Messiah. They did not stop to reflect that he was also proclaiming himself a man of peace and giving no countenance to the nationalistic fervor. They wanted a Messiah, and they saw one. All four Gospels say the, the same thing. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, while the other Gospels include a word, Hosanna. Hosanna means, please save us. But it's said in such a way that it's both in confidence and plea. Please save us! The Jewish people are crying out for an earthly ruler. They're keen to deliver them from what is here and now. They're letting their circumstances of what they're going through in this current moment in time depict the version of Jesus they want to see not Jesus who he is. Aren't we guilty of that today? It's funny when you go through all these Bible studies and you have people centuries ago who, you know, it's in the scripture how we're, we're no different through all the modern advances of technology and, and you know, medical advances. We, we are still the same sinful nature of people. We can thank the Gospel of Luke for adding one, one line at the end of this. It's not in the other Gospels. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. In verse 40, he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So whether the Jews were shouting it or not, Jesus is still triumphant. He's still the king. He didn't need the followers. He's still the triumphant king. Jesus is walking death row. I get emotional when I get to this part. Jesus is walking death row. He's coming down out of the mountain. And people are praising his name. And right here in verse 40 and verse 41, the topic changes. See, our sin deserves God's wrath. And God is in complete opposition to sin. Our Savior and King is coming down the mountain, fulfilling prophecy, having lived a sinless life to die a sinner's death, the death we all deserve, and God's will is going to be done. Jerusalem has witnessed Jesus' miracles, heard his parables, and yet some are still crying out for a temporary leader. They're asking for a David, a physical rule to deliver them from Rome. You have people practicing religion, religiously, people practicing their religion 
and yet they can't even see the Jesus that's in front of them. As believers, we often find ourselves doing the same types of things today. It's a fine line to walk between asking for what we need and asking for what we want. We often try to reconcile our sins against other sinners. We follow people in our lives that are only temporary. Tim opened, when we started Luke, he opened with, it's in the Gospel of Luke, peace on earth. And now the theme here is changing to peace in heaven. We don't reconcile our sins with men, we reconcile them with Jesus. Colossians 1.20 says, And through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So right here, I want you to get your mind in this, in this context where we are. Jesus on the back of a donkey, coming into Jerusalem, knowing what's ahead of him. In verse 30, 41, now he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it. Jesus is heading into the city of peace. People are proclaiming him as king, and he begins to weep. This is a funny context. You think of somebody as king as regal, and somebody who, um, you know, it would, it is ready for the worship. But here he begins to weep. Why does Jesus weep? We see three times in Scripture where Jesus weeps. The first being that we've already been through in Luke. Um, We've seen him once before weep at Lazarus' tomb. Uh, He was moved with compassion for Mary for her loss and the, the grief that she was suffering. And he began to weep with her for her loss. And in this part of Luke... Jesus weeps for the lost. He is utterly broken at the condition of the hearts of his people. Everywhere around him, he is coming out of the mountain, people headed to Passover, still searching for an earthly inheritance, asking for a David-like king when they have Jesus the Redeemer in their very presence. No matter where Jesus looked, he found cause for weeping. If he looked behind him, he saw the nation that had wasted its opportunities and been ignorant of their time of visitation. If he looked within the people around him, he saw nothing but spiritual ignorance, blindness in the hearts of the people. They should have known who he was, for God had given them his word and sent messengers to prepare the way. If he looked around, Jesus saw nothing but religious activity that accomplished very little. The temple had become a den of thieves, and the religious leaders were out to kill him. The city was filled with pilgrims celebrating a festival, but the hearts of the people were heavy with sin and life's burdens. As Jesus looked ahead, he wept as he saw the terrible judgment coming to the nation. For those who who are history buffs, in 70 AD, the Romans would eventually come in after a siege of 143 days, kill 600,000 Jews, take 1,000 more captive, and destroyed the temple in the city just a few years after this. Why did all of this happen? Because the people did not know that God had visited them. He came into his own, and they didn't receive him. As Jason begins to play, you know, I... I, I specifically asked for him to play this song. It's called Brokenness Aside. And it really is a picture of what Jesus is weeping over. See, Jesus doesn't care about who you were, what's going on in your life right now. Jesus is with you. Just as Jesus weeps over Lazarus' tomb, if you're hurting, Jesus is weeping with you. He knows your grief. And just as Jesus is headed into Jerusalem. If you're apart from God, if you're full of sin, Jesus is weeping for you, for the condition of your soul, to have that relationship with you, the lost relationship that he could have with you, he's weeping over it. The third time that we witnessed Jesus weeping was for the Father's will to be done. Before he's climbing up on the cross and dying for our sins. A mighty
mighty king weeping over the condition of the lost, humbling himself to die for those. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. It's a convicting part of scripture normally reserved for Easter. Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. Jesus coming down as royalty, coming down on a donkey, weeping over Jerusalem, headed into a city full of sin, a city that will reject him. Are you rejecting the grace of God today? Jesus is weeping for those who are lost. So as we begin to sing and pray, I want you to know two things, three things. If you're hurting, God is weeping with you. If you're lost, God is weeping for you. And if you need direction, God is weeping for his will to be done. So as we begin to sing the invitation, I want you to feel free to make this altar a place of prayer, a place of repentance, a place of need. A place of need. I'm here to pray with you if you need me. Tim is here to pray with you if you, if, if you need to. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, thank you for your word and your gospel. God, ultimately, thank you for the cross. Though we don't deserve it, Lord, you loved us anyway. You climbed up on that cross and died for our sins. Not from any countenance of us, Lord, but to solve a problem that had happened centuries ago in Genesis 3, God, when sin entered this world, you already had a plan in place to reconcile sin before yourself so we didn't have to reconcile sins before man. Thank you. Lord, I pray as we move into this time of invitation, God, that that call to action and those questions that I ask, Lord, I pray that those are getting answered by the Holy Spirit as we sing today, Lord. And if any of those need to step out in faith, do not miss your moment of visitation. The time is now, and there is no, no better time than now. Step forward in faith and action, God. Lord, speak to these hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.
job. Give the Lord a hand for what he did through Lee. I know Lee would never take the credit uh, for that, uh, but man, God used him to do it. just do a great job. And again, I think this is the first time you've preached, right? You've taught lessons he's never preached for, and God used him in a great way. And it's just a great reminder to me, you know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you guys blessed the staff and said, hey, thank you, staff appreciation. But I want to tell you this morning, we need to give thanks to the Lord God of heaven uh, because this is what the church body is supposed to be about. I'm not supposed to be a figurehead. I'm not supposed to be in charge. Uh, man, my, my responsibility is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And what encourages my heart, the reason I praise the Lord is because he has brought people like you here, people like Lee, people like Chuck, so many servant leaders in the life of this church. It, it really, my job is to work myself out of a job. And I'm so thankful that God has brought so many people to serve in the life of this church, that he's calling men and women to ministry vocations. Um, because, listen, it helps keep all of us on. There are a lot of preachers who want to make their church ride and fall on them. And that ought not to be the way it is. We ought to be lifting up Jesus. We ought to be following Jesus. We ought to be crying out to Jesus. And when we do that corporately, man, this is the result. God works through men and women to bring glory and honor to him, to build a church, to make a difference in a community. I, listen, thank you for saying thanks to us a couple of weeks ago, but I'm thankful to the Lord God, and I'm thankful to you. Because without you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible. God, through us, is what's going to make a difference. So, Lee, thank you for being an example of that today, that this is where we can all find our opportunity to worship and serve the Lord God, to lift him up, to call out to him to follow him with everything that we have. Hey, let's pray together this morning and then you'll be dismissed. God, thank you so much. Thank you for being King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And God, thank you so much that you are the only one. God, our hearts are plenty divided, but they don't have to be. There is only one God. There is only one Lord. There is only one Spirit. God, we thank you so much that you give us the opportunity to be in a relationship with you, to be following you, to call out to you, to receive you. And Father God, so, so often we make the Christian journey a difficult escapade, but it's not difficult. It's just humbling ourselves and calling out and worshiping the only one that deserves it, and that is you. Father God, thank you for dying for us and giving us right standing through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Thank you for giving us that fellowship. God, thank you so much that you want to use us. God, you, you didn't just save us to, to sit around. You saved us to bring glory and honor to you. We get to have a relationship with you forever, but God, it starts now. And if we are starting that relationship now, the people around us should be impacted and influenced by what you're doing through us. God, thank you so much for the words you brought through Lee this morning. Thank you for using him. But God, I pray right now that we would take these questions to heart. And that we would let the Holy Spirit answer them even as we leave this place. God, we love you. We praise you. And we ask right now for your will to be done. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Missed.